Is the government hiding crashed UFOs beneath Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio? I would say we probably retrieved dozens of crashed saucers. Are there declassified government documents that prove that UFO wreckage was secretly flown to the base? Reports claim anywhere from 14 to 16 bodies were recovered from the craft. For the first time on television, exclusive stories from deep behind the secrecy. I had a top secret SCI clearance. I've never told this story on TV before. Is there a conspiracy to hide UFO evidence at the highest levels of the US government? Or is it all just a myth? If you want to know the truth about UFOs, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base would be the place to go. Join us as the UFO Files uncovers the facts behind the legend of Hangar 18. July 1947. Roswell, New Mexico. Wreckage of an unknown craft litters a field measuring almost a mile long and hundreds of yards wide. The U.S. Army sends trucks filled with soldiers to the location. Their mission, to secure and retrieve everything from the crash site. The military initially calls the craft a flying disc in a press release. The Army quickly recants the UFO story, and a press conference is scheduled in which the media is told that the wreckage is nothing more than a weather balloon. But according to many UFO researchers, at the same time that the press is distracted with supposedly fake debris, the actual Roswell wreckage and possibly other retrieved items are taken under military control they are surreptitiously flown almost 1,500 miles away to a military base in Dayton, Ohio, named Wright Field. According to UFO legend, its precise destination is a hangar on the base, Hangar 18. We know that stuff got shipped to Wright because of the testimony of the people who were involved in the shipments on both ends. A declassified FBI document dated July 8, 1947, the same week as the Roswell crash, also provides ties to Wright Field. The object found resembles a high altitude weather balloon with a radar reflector, but that telephonic conversation between their office and Wright Field had not borne out this belief. Disc and balloon being transported to Wright Field by special plane for examination. Soon after the Roswell debris arrives, the class of 1947 from the military's elite airman training facility, the prestigious Air War College, is flown to Wright Field to investigate. One of the officers on scene is a battle-tested hero of World War II, a fighter pilot whose reputation earns him the nickname Black Mac. But nothing would prepare Marion Magruder and his classmates for what they would witness at Wright Field it would change their lives forever. He saw metal that was very pliable that you could wrinkle up in your hands. And then it would go right back into shape and it was very light and yet you couldn't tear it apart. He saw parts of wreckage of what were extraterrestrial craft. He saw bodies and he also saw a living being. He said that it was childlike, very thin, with an oversized head and long arms uh, with four digits. My father referred to the fact that we killed it. I'm sure we did not do it on purpose, but they were experimenting and obviously we did not know how to make this entity live. But this being did die and the way he referred to it is, we killed him. According to his son, Mark, Lieutenant Colonel Magruder and his classmates are sworn to secrecy under threat of court-martial. 
Because of this, he keeps his secret for 50 years, even from his family. But in 1997, his health fading, Black Mac begins to open up to those closest to him. I said, Dad, are you finally going to tell us what you know so that we will know? And at the time, he said it was an awesome secret to carry all of his life, to know that there were more than us on this earth, and to not be able to tell anybody. I've never told this story on TV before, and it's difficult to do it now because I want my father's legacy to be as honorable as his life was. And it's very important to me that you know that I'm telling you the truth as he absolutely knew it to be. He just needed to let us know, his children know, that we weren't alone. Black Mac Magruder's story is not an isolated tale. In fact, for more than half a century, similar stories have surfaced about UFO wreckage, alien bodies, secret underground cryogenic chambers, and a mysterious hangar at the base. Wright Field would grow and be renamed Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, but questions about the base and its legendary Hangar 18 would remain. Hangar 18 has always been a mystery at Patterson Air Force Base. If you want to know the truth about UFOs, about the craft, the debris, probably the records, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, in my estimation, would be the place to go. If these claims are true, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, one of the largest and most important in America's military, could be ground zero for recovered UFO material. All the information I have from all my sources says it was shipped here, and the people who actually worked at Wright-Patterson, who actually wore a uniform here, said it was here. Wreckage, entire pieces of the craft and whole sections of the craft, bodies were brought in. In fact, bodies were brought in on a regular basis from a number of different crashes from Roswell on. Not only was debris from many UFO crashes allegedly shipped to the base, but from the late 1940s until the end of the 1960s, all reports regarding UFOs were conducted at Wright-Patterson for the military's official UFO investigation, Project Blue Book. Wright-Patterson evolved into one of the most talked about bases in UFO lore. However, the Air Force's description of the base is much different. Really what makes Wright-Patterson unique is we are by and large focused on tomorrow. What is tomorrow's Air Force going to look like? What kind of airplanes will we fly? What kind of weapons will be on those aircraft? What kind of technology will be in the cockpit? We have the Air Force Research Laboratory here. We buy all of the aircraft in the United States Air Force through the offices that are here. We are responsible for all of the flight test, all of the science and technology. We're also responsible for all of the major intelligence that's done for air and space. Some of the research that goes on in technology may be classified because we're trying to protect the technology that we develop to make sure that we provide our soldiers and our airmen the, the best advantage. Until the early 1990s, much of this scientifically advanced work was done by the Foreign Technology Division, or FTD, which many researchers believe is the key to understanding Wright-Patterson's role in UFO history. The Foreign Technology Division was the Air Force unit that was responsible for uh, scientific and technical intelligence as, uh, as it applied to the air and space and missile uh, capability of mainly the Soviet Union. They were there to prevent technological surprise. Uh, they were the experts in the bad guys equipment. Wright Patterson has a history of duplicating Russian equipment, German equipment, and reverse engineering it. Why would they not do the same thing with extraterrestrial technology? 
And so there's no question in my mind that's exactly what we're doing. March 25th, 1948, Aztec, New Mexico. What starts as a normal day for local oil workers turns into an encounter with the unknown. As they approach the western edge of the mesa, a large silver object grabs their attention. When the oil workers got to the mesa, there was a disc approximately 100 feet in diameter. Because the ship is found intact, it appears to be a landing as opposed to a crash. The witnesses I talked to, both Ken Farley and Doug Nolan, young men at the time, would not enter the craft. Bill Ferguson, the foreman, uh, more senior gentleman, uh, was yelling at the, the workers to get away from it. Except for a shattered porthole, there isn't any immediate sign of damage. Doug Nolan reported to me he saw two bodies through the porthole slumped over. Within hours, trucks arrive, supposedly from Camp Hale, Colorado. It appears the U.S. government has another UFO incident to contend with. Having learned from their mistakes at Roswell, the Army quickly takes control of the situation. Roswell, nine months earlier, had been sort of botched by putting it on the front page of many newspapers around the country. I think the military had really fine-tuned their skills on going in and retrieving a downed flying disc or UFO. The secrecy started immediately upon the military's arrival at the crash site. They separated the uh, locals and uh, reminded them of their patriotic duty for the United States and swore them to secrecy. 58 years ago, you told to shut up for national security, you did it because you respected and trusted the government. The military wanted that craft immediately and they would do whatever it took to get it out of there. According to the eyewitnesses, the Army recovers between 14 and 16 badly burned alien bodies from the craft. The recovery team reportedly brings both the ship and the alien corpses to a local safe house away from the media. Take it to the nearest military base where you can control access to it, and then you arrange to ship it to an appropriate place, depending on what you want done. But again, Wright-Patterson would be the eventual repository. Because of the number of alien bodies at Aztec, it is considered one of the most significant UFO retrievals to date. But UFO researchers say there are many other cases tied to Wright Field. October 1947, Paradise Valley, Arizona. May 1953, Kingman, Arizona. June 1953, Laredo, Texas, and December 5, 1965, Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, are only a few of the alleged flying saucer recoveries in the U.S. alone. No matter where a UFO lands, it seems all roads lead back to Wright-Patterson and Hangar 18. The wright Pat was kind of a graveyard for some of these things and uh, probably put them in a holding pattern until technology got to where they could look at them better. But despite countless books and the public interest in UFOs, there was no official confirmation about alien aircraft at Hangar 18. Eventually, attention shifted away from Wright-Patterson. Interest was revived, however, in 1978 when UFO researcher Leonard Stringfield gave a speech at the annual Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON Symposium, coincidentally held in Dayton, Ohio, Wright-Patterson's home. Len was doing things in this field that nobody else had done. He actually had developed a number of people that were leaking information to him. 
They were given testimony on things that they had seen and done, uh, not just one person, but a whole entourage of people that he developed a, a trust where people knew they could trust him and, and he wouldn't expose them and they could give him the information and he could correlate it with others and then determine what's real and what isn't. Streamfield wrote several books on the subject of UFO crashes and their retrievals. Because of the secrecy involved, many of his sources didn't want their full names published for fear of losing their top secret government jobs. Among the stories of wreckage being stored at Hangar 18 at Wright-Patterson was a tale about a Navy pilot identified only as PJ, who, along with several others, accidentally entered a restricted hangar. For a brief 30 seconds, a disc-shaped object of metallic color, 15 feet wide and eight feet deep was seen. I cannot confirm anything other than it was there. According to Stringfield's research, they were confronted by the guards and quickly escorted out of the hangar. Once outside, we had reassured each other that the good old U.S. had developed, or had all along, flying saucers in service. As these stories started surfacing, other witnesses came forward. UFO researcher and Aberdeen, Washington police detective, James Clarkson, located June Crane, a former employee of Wright-Patterson from the Roswell era. She agreed to sit down with him for an audio interview in 1997. Crane's story dates back to the early 1950s. According to the documents she supplied to Clarkson, she was a clerk typist with access to top secret information. One afternoon, a lieutenant surprised her with a piece of unusual metal. He threw it on my desk and he says, June, you're a good wrecker. Tear that thing apart. Break that up. And I took it and I bent it and I twisted it and I laid, laid it back down and it went, got right back the same shape. So it's, it's fairly thick, but it doesn't weigh anything. But it had no weight at all. It was like a feather. I, I said, well, what is it? And he says, piece of a spaceship. He said, I just come back from New Mexico and I brought it with me. It is the early 1950s. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is at the center of America's high-tech war effort and the Air Force's most sophisticated technology. It is also home to the government's crash retrieval program, which these declassified documents describe as designed to capture for study non-U.S. space objects or objects of unknown origin. It was codenamed Project Moondust. Items retrieved by Moondust were then shipped to the Foreign Technology Division at Wright-Patterson. Project Moondust had to do really with us collecting space junk, things that would uh, be falling out of the sky. When a Soviet satellite fell, when a piece of a Soviet missile or a space launch vehicle landed in an area that we could get to, it was important to, to glean as much of this equipment as possible so that we could study its technical makeup, its structure and the components and so forth. It was not uncommon for examples of uh, foreign air, space and missile technology to be brought back here to Wright-Patterson, uh, even fragments of them, if that's all that uh, could be located. The situation is the same. Here's an unknown aerial vehicle coming down. Let's keep people away from it. Let's grab the wreckage ourselves, and let's lie about it so nobody knows what we've done. Standard practice. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about airplanes or saucers. One Wright-Patterson employee who may have had access to information about these recoveries was clerk typist June Crane. According to Crane, her top secret clearance allowed her to witness high-level base information, including, she claims, 
classified files on UFO crash retrievals. In 1997, Crane told UFO researcher James Clarkson her story of downed alien aircraft. There was three times that I'm aware of. I won't vouch for the fourth one because I wouldn't. Are these, these three crashes that you heard about while you worked at Wright-Patterson? Well, one was the Roswell and then there was two other ones. So as of 1952, they knew about three crashes right, right, of vehicles that were probably extraterrestrial. Right, right. And then the one where they brought the two men into Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and put them in the icebox. I didn't see it because nobody was allowed to see it. Okay, when two little men... He, he called them little green men. He, then he described them as a greenish blue. And they were four foot tall and they were dead. And we're talking about non-humans. Non-humans, right. According to Clarkson, Crane had kept her silence for 45 years. At the time, she had been forced to sign a confidentiality agreement and was liable for a $10,000 fine. But by 1997, Crane changed her mind. In an email from Clarkson to UFO Files, he explains June had told him, I'm 72 years old. What are they going to do, shoot me or put me in prison? I think I can handle either one. June passed away in 1998 but her testimony would appear to provide witness to alien bodies at Wright-Patterson. According to many in the UFO field, she is not alone. I have talked to a number of people and interviewed a smaller number at some depth who have said that there were bodies at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and bodies recovered from Roswell. And remember, Wright-Patterson did have the capability of providing low temperature storage for biological specimens. They had an anthropoid laboratory there, you know, apes and monkeys and stuff like that. That's a great cover for aliens as well. Additional stories of aliens at Wright-Patterson can be found in the papers of Leonard Stringfield, the ufologist who specialized in crash retrieval. Most of Stringfield's eyewitnesses preferred to remain anonymous or simply go by their initials. One of them, an unnamed former naval intelligence officer, claims to have been present when alien bodies arrived in 1953. I saw the bodies at Wright Patterson. I was in the right place at the right time when the crates arrived at night by DC-7. Stringfield also interviewed an anonymous army officer who claimed to have witnessed another group of four alien bodies being brought to Wright-Patterson in 1957. According to the general, the four bodies, approximately five feet in height, were sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where he had seen them in a deep freeze morgue, kept at approximately 120 degrees below zero for preservation. Despite Stringfield's passion for the subject, many ufologists were frustrated by his unwillingness to reveal his sources' identities for additional confirmation. The UFO community was very interested, of course. Uh, any hint of a crash it always gets everybody's attention. But the fact that he wouldn't give his sources was really upsetting to a lot of the people because they wanted to run off and check for themselves. And rightly so, why not? I've tried to tell people he should be given credit for speaking out, for collecting, but let's not take anything he said as gospel because we need verification and validation, and very rarely did Len have that. But not all of the witnesses requested to remain anonymous. Respected UFO investigator Ted Phillips told Stringfield he'd been given access to several top secret photos that showed details of some of the alien bodies supposedly stored at Wright-Patterson. The hand uh, had long, thin appendages, fingers, I suppose. And there was a sort of membrane between the fingers. I'd not seen anything like that before and for some reason mentioned it to Lynn, he became excited because he had seen the same thing. I don't know what the origin of the photos might be, but uh, I do trust the source. 
regardless of the various witnesses Stringfield interviewed, the descriptions of the actual aliens that were maintained in Hangar 18 were all similar. The general testimony about bodies is quite consistent. Little guys, big heads, relatively long arms, upper arm longer than the lower arm, which was the reverse for us, Four long skinny fingers would have made a good violinist, as one witness said. A slit for a mouth, no visible teeth, not really a nose, but two little holes, holes for the ears, big eyes for body size, short guys, little guys, little gray men if you want, not green, gray. I have heard that there were live aliens kept alive for a certain period of time, maybe years after Roswell, let's say. Now, they would certainly have done all kinds of testing on them. If you had a body of an occupant of a crash flying disc, you would definitely autopsy it and try to figure out how its uh, physiology was different than that of humans, how its DNA was different than that of humans in some pretty advanced investigations, I'm sure. Now, if this was coupled with analysis of test results from live aliens, then you'd really have a very exciting biological study project. Is there evidence of a secret underground vault that holds these alien bodies the biggest kept secret was the huge cryogenics networks that were required to support and preserve these bodies. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is a vast military complex. Officially, it employs 22,000 men and women and is the home of the 88th Air Base Wing the National Air and Space Intelligence Center, and the Air Force Materiel Command. But since the alleged UFO crash at Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, there have been rumors linking the base to the storage and study of UFO crash remnants, and even alien bodies. The military says none of this is true, but those who've studied it say Wright-Patterson is large enough and secure enough to hold a multitude of secrets. I spent 22 years in the military, about six, about six years at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Author and retired Air Force Captain Robert Collins says he was a research analyst for the Foreign Technology Division, the FTD, the unit most commonly linked to UFO studies on the base. His official job was to analyze Soviet technology, but Collins has also spent years researching the link between UFOs and Wright-Patterson. In his book, Exempt from Disclosure, Collins determines the mystery of Hangar 18 may lie in a vast underground infrastructure hidden from the thousands of eyes that frequent the base. The reason you don't want to use hangars and the reason you want to use underground vaults is because you want to keep things under cryogenic temperatures and you want to keep it cold and you want to keep it secure. Then uh, the underground vaults would be the ideal place to keep it. Now we do have a lot of evidence that supports the idea that these vaults were there. This underground structure was enormous and a uh, huge long tunnel areas that connected these vaults. There are about four vaults that are about 100 by 100 feet. We found out that these things exist. The question is, what was in them? I'm convinced that the stuff that was recovered from Roswell and other crashes was put in these vaults. UFO researchers have long heard reports of such a network underneath the base. 
but Collins' work may provide a more specific view of those tunnels, one that helps construct a diagram of what may exist at the base. According to his research, there is a Building 18 complex instead of a Hangar 18. The structure he found that fit the description is the neighboring building, number 23. Collins claims it was previously known as Hangar 23. Now, the way I understand it, that back in the early 50s, sometime perhaps between 51 and 53, a craft was brought in here. The uh, floor of the uh, Hangar 23 was removed and this craft was put in the basement of the hangar and then the floor was covered over the craft. Uh, and then there was a vault area in building 18F with a tunnel that was constructed and built over to hangar 23. While it is possible that building 23 was the legendary hangar 18, most researchers have continued to focus on the importance of the underground tunnels. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is honeycombed with below ground level facilities. These pits were dug in various configurations and were deep enough to where if covered over would have made an ideal remote examination laboratory for somebody trying to examine alien artifacts that had been recovered elsewhere. By interviewing various Air Force personnel who were supposedly granted access to the top secret underground vault, Collins felt he was able to confirm many of the rumors. The biggest kept secret was the huge cryogenics uh, networks that were required to support and preserve these bodies. And I understand it was quite extensive. There were huge cryogenic uh, storage tubes that uh, these so-called three foot four or three foot six aliens were kept in these canisters under cryogenic temperatures. What actually lies beneath Wright-Patterson may be impossible to confirm. The Air Force Base operates under the highest security, keeping access to the base and these vaults secret from almost everyone, even their own. The secrecy goes all the way to the top. It's a question of absolutely the highest level of classification that exists in the United States government as far as I know. A formerly classified memo from mid-July 1947 points to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover showing immense interest in a retrieved craft and his frustration about being kept out of the loop. We must insist on full access to disc recovered. The Army grabbed it and would not let us have it for cursory examination. The memo was written just days after the Roswell, New Mexico wreckage was taken to Wright Field. If J. Edgar Hoover couldn't get access to the contents of Hangar 18, how high did the secrecy go? In a 1994 interview with Larry King on TNT, Senator Barry Goldwater detailed his attempt to visit Hangar 18. I think at Wright-Patterson, if you could get into certain places, you'd find out what the Air Force and the government does know about UFOs. Reportedly, a spaceship landed. It was all hushed up. I called Curtis LeMay and I said, General, I know we have a room at Wright-Patterson where you put all the secret stuff. Could I go in there? Well, I've never heard General LeMay get mad, but he got madder than hell at me. Cussed me out and said, don't ever ask me that question again. How much was there, we don't know. Whether it was just documents, or specimens, or pieces, nobody knows. But the story dates back to Goldwater, and I think there's almost no question that it's a very true story. They are schematics, once classified as secret. Designs of a craft that appears to be a flying saucer. Various unconfirmed stories have emerged of disc-shaped vehicles being developed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. But these declassified government documents from 1955 reveal that the Air Technical Intelligence Center at Wright-Patterson had in fact begun work 
on a disc-shaped craft named Project Silverbug. It was a circular aircraft about 35 feet in diameter, had a crew of one pilot, and uh, was capable of a vertical takeoff at about 2,000 miles an hour. There are witnesses who swear it eventually flew, but most accounts state that Silverbug probably remained on the drawing board. But Project Silverbug wasn't the only example of the military's interest in disc-shaped vehicles. Eleven years later, a former pilot who was walking through the hangars at Wright-Patterson during a reunion of his squadron, the Flying Tigers, says he accidentally saw a similarly designed aircraft. Mr. Warren Botts, who had an inquisitive mind at the time, was going through these different hangar bays. When he got to hangar number four, bay E, he went through the doorway there. There was an armed guard at the facility who did not see him at, in the beginning. He started approaching the port main landing gear to investigate it, and that's where the guard stopped him, questioned his authority, and told him he was not supposed to be in there. But he did see a very large monster, his words, of an aircraft that was 116 feet in diameter, at least 12 feet off the hangar floor. Although the name of that specific project has never been disclosed, the U.S. military was apparently interested in a craft that could have looked like this. With Wright-Patterson's history of reverse engineering foreign technology, is it possible that some of the military's advances were gained from retrieved UFOs? I think we've made a great deal of effort to learn bits and pieces based on the, both the recovered wreckage and the instrument data from tracking UFOs. I don't think we've yet learned how to duplicate that technology overall, that is to build something that could fly the way saucers or motherships do. If you're given Christopher Columbus an unlimited budget in 1493 and a nuclear submarine and say, Chris is your reward, here's this great nuclear submarine and an unlimited budget, I need two more of these. Could he have built one? Not a chance. Summer 1980, mysterious lights fill the night skies above Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Newspapers and countless eyewitnesses report the aircraft was unlike anything they'd ever seen. The main reports we saw was the object was moving up and down, was brightly lit, it hovered for long periods of time, and some people said it seemed to disappear over Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. But the biggest thing that gave us what we felt was the conclusive evidence that was something from Wright Field was when the two Middletown policemen chased it. They chased it for a long ways towards Dayton, Ohio, and then lost it in an area that they felt was heading for a Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Wilhelm, a retired Army Master Sergeant and UFO investigator, suspected the military may have been secretly testing the newly developed Harrier jet on the base. The British-designed craft combines the vertical abilities of a helicopter and the forward thrust of a conventional jet. After releasing his findings to the media, Wilhelm was quickly contacted by the military. I got a phone call from a major from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and he asked me a lot of questions, and at the very end, he did say, I cannot make any comments, Mr. Wilhelm, but all I can say is you've done your homework. So a lot of things that people think they see that's strange doesn't mean that it's a craft from another world. Most of the time, it's our military developing some of our technology, which we need very badly. And it's the reason why they don't say a whole lot. And I commend them for them, and I back them up 100%. The Harrier incident raises another possibility about activities at Wright-Patterson. Perhaps many of the legends about Hangar 18 are actually a cover-up for top-secret military programs. I think it's important to keep in mind that the government, in association with Air Force OSI Counterintelligence Division, would really like to extend the alien myth as a cover to hide their own deep black programs. Well, it means that they want everyone to believe that what you're seeing out there 
is extraterrestrial and we do not have the technology to duplicate what we're seeing in the skies. I think to the extent that they can confuse or disinform folks about flying discs and make it look like a terrestrial innovation, the more they'll do that. It's in the government's best interest to distribute disinformation if you want to keep a secret secret. The debate over Hangar 18 and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base may never be completely resolved. I would say upward of over 80% convinced that it's true. There was wreckage there, there were bodies brought there. Research was done here up to maybe 81 or 82, and then they packed everything up and moved it because of security leaks. That's when all the little stories about Green Men uh, ceased, about that time frame. Most researchers speculate that any work being done involving UFOs at Wright-Patterson may have been relocated to another top secret base, Area 51, the mysterious airfield hidden in the Nevada desert. Area 51 developed because of its location, away from anything. And Wright-Patterson is in Dayton, Ohio. It's in the middle of a, a major town. So I think uh, Area 51 would have been the ideal location. Officially, the government won't confirm that any actual UFO wreckage exists at all. Despite the denials, there are government documents that indicate that wreckage from Roswell and other mysterious crashes were shipped to Wright-Patterson for purposes of examining the debris. Government programs existed that show the airbase had an interest in gathering any foreign space vehicles it could locate. And there is testimony that the government wants to keep all of this under wraps, even from some of its most prominent officials. But why? What is the truth behind the legend of Hangar 18? Nobody can conclusively prove without hard evidence that we do have alien bodies. It's all just rumor and speculation. It's so much more romantic to think that we have it is, but again, no concrete physical evidence has appeared after 60 years of this mystery. There really was a Roswell spacecraft, and there really were other UFOs that were recovered by uh, forces loyal to the United States. It's just that the classic Hangar 18 was more of something that you would see in the movies, and it was part of the rumors that circulated the UFO community for well over 35 years. The bottom line is that since we've collected flying discs, we're not going to throw them away. They either exist at Wright-Patterson or they exist in an underground facility somewhere in the U.S. West. Wherever it is, they exist in a warehouse under U.S. control and they haven't been thrown away. <laughs>